Hello, Giorgio Romanich here. Today we will talk about centrifugal force. Namely, we will continue where we stopped in the last video on uh, non-inertial reference frames and uh, how the application of the second Newton's law in, in non-inertial reference frames results in the so-called apparent forces. And uh, we ended up with three apparent forces, namely Coriolis force, Euler force and uh, centrifugal force. In today's video, we will examine in detail centrifugal force and something called apparent gravity. So, this video will be more than 20 minutes long, and uh, without any further ado, let's uh, jump straight into it and uh, talk about uh, centrifugal force. This is where we concluded last time. In the last video, we derived this equation that uh, extends second Newton's law to non-inertial reference frames. Coriolis force, Euler force, and uh, centrifugal force. I highly recommend you check that video because in order to understand this equation properly, it is not enough to watch this video. In the previous one, we derived it explicitly. In today's video, the goal is only to look into the centrifugal force. To do that, I will look into Earth as being a perfect spherical object. Center of the Earth is uh, inertial frame of reference, it is not rotating. I have the axis of rotation going through the Earth's center. And Earth is rotating with some angular velocity omega. I will take a point here on the surface of the Earth. From the center of the Earth, the distance to that point is r, radius of the Earth. And this point also has latitude phi. This point over here is actually non-inertial reference frame because it is rotating with this angular velocity omega. I will take that positive z direction, zn. Positive z direction is upward. Positive y direction of this reference frame is toward the north. So this would be y n. And positive x direction is into the page or towards the east. Now, when we cast the problem in this form, we immediately see that in the above equation, x n is actually radius vector r. We also assume that this point is fixed on the surface of the Earth and it is not moving relative to the Earth, which means that Vn is uh, also zero. Similarly, we know that omega is constant in time. It doesn't change over time. And this point is not moving towards or away from the Earth's center, which means that this acceleration i a n this one is also zero now equipped with this knowledge the above equation reduces to what well force in non-inertial reference frame is forces in inertial reference frame this term disappears this term disappears because vn is zero this term disappears because omega is constant and we are only left with the centrifugal force m omega cross product omega cross x uh, but not xn because xn is r so cross r now if we assume that the only inertial force is gravity so fi is gravity mg so I suggest you check my video on uh, gravity. Then the above expression becomes Fn is equal uh, mg minus m omega cross product omega cross r. And this expression over here is also known as the vector form of the equation for apparent or fictitious gravity. 
namely the real gravity that we talked about in uh, one of my previous videos, is reduced for the value of centrifugal force. If we re remove masses, then these become accelerations, of course. So in order to calculate this apparent acceleration due to centrifugal acceleration, we need to find the components of these three vectors, namely component of g, components of g, components of omega, and components of r. And this is what we will do next. Of course, it is very easy to find components of vector g because gravity is always attractive and is pulling things towards the center of the Earth. So the components are 0, 0, minus g. It is equally easy to find components of vector r because it also has components 0, 0. It's always radially, but radially out. So 0, 0, r where this r is the magnitude of radius vector. So lastly, we need to find components of omega, which is uh, just a little bit more complicated, but not too complicated compared to the other uh, two vectors. To do that, I will consider only one hemisphere of the Earth. Let's say this is the north hemisphere of the Earth, and I have my point over here. This is the radius vector of that point and this is the latitude phi what i plotted here now the omega is let's say this so the point is rotating with the angular velocity omega which is everywhere the same so what i need to do is i need to decompose this omega into radial direction or the direction of zn and into direction of y n. So this would be omega z component of omega, and this would be omega y component of the omega, and you can see that omega in the x direction doesn't have component. Because this is phi, you can clearly see this angle here is also phi, which means that omega z component is omega sine phi, omega y component is omega cosine phi, and as I just said, omega x is equal to zero, namely there is no x component of the omega vector. Now, when I know components of omega, I know components of g, and I know components of r, I can go ahead and calculate this triple vector product. And I will do that on the next page. So, as I said, we need to calculate this triple cross product. So, there are several ways to do it. For me, the easiest is first to calculate cross product between omega and r, and then to calculate cross product between omega and whatever we get for, for omega cross r. So, first, omega cross r is equal. The way we calculate cross product, first row is unit vectors i, j, k. The second row is the component of omega, which we just calculated to determine to be on, uh, zero omega cosine phi or phi and omega sine phi. And the last row is the components of R, which is 0, 0, R. The I component, R omega cosine phi minus 0 minus this is 0. Then the second is minus J. So I cross this and I will get R times 0 minus 0 times this term. So I get 0 minus 0 and uh, plus k term which will be when I cross this row and column 0 min times 0 minus 0 times this again 0 times uh, minus 0 which means that the only term that survives is uh, this component along the i unit vector so 
this is equal r omega cosine phi times i. But this is not the end of the road because now I need to use this result to calculate omega cross this. So omega cross omega cross r then becomes again first row is i j k the second row is omega components which are the same 0 omega cosine phi omega sine phi and the third row is now components of omega cross r which I just calculated here and it has only component along the i direction which is r omega cosine phi and the other two components are zero. So when I calculate this is equal to i and along the i I have zero minus zero as you can see then minus j component in the j direction I have 0 minus r omega square times sine phi times cosine phi and lastly plus k so in the k direction I have 0 minus this times this which is r omega squared cosine squared phi my centrifugal acceleration minus omega cross omega cross r is equal or has components 0 minus r omega squared sine phi cosine phi or phi I'm not sure what's the right way to pronounce it and r omega squared cosine phi this is the centrifugal acceleration on the surface of the earth now we can finally calculate the apparent gravity if we wish because in the z direction only this term will contribute to my apparent gravity and i will call apparent gravity g prime that will be g gravity real gravity minus this term r omega squared sorry there is a square here cosine squared phi this is the equation for the apparent gravity and you can see that it is function of latitude Overall variation along the surface of the Earth is 0.3% in respect to the real gravity G. Of course, the smallest contribution is at the poles and the largest contribution of centrifugal acceleration is at the equator. For example, I live in Montreal where the latitude is 45.5 degrees approximately and then the apparent gravity g prime is approximately 9.797 meters per second square which is basically again 9.8 which is the value that we always use in our calculations because this g remember 
is uh, 9.81, the, the, the classical value that we use. This result also means that if you are not happy with your weight, but you don't feel like taking uh, some strict diet, you can take your scale to equator and your weight on equator will be smaller for the value r omega squared cosine squared phi. Isaac Newton managed to calculate that if the earth was uh, a fluid, let's say water, then the radius of the earth at equator would be 1 over 230 times larger, so 1 in 230 larger than the radius of the earth at the poles. Clearly, the figure that I made here is over-exaggerating his calculation. Because Earth is uh, not uniformly uh, distributed uh, material, namely there are variations in density, our measurements showed that the real variation is rather 1 over 298.2 to something, I forgot. And you can see how close Sir Isaac Newton was with his theoretical calculation in respect to the measured or observed value. Yes, the bulging of the Earth close to the equator is due to centrifugal force or centrifugal acceleration that we discussed here. Now we will talk uh, about difference between uh, centrifugal and centripetal force. First we need to know if an object is in orbit, there must be a force that keeps that object in the orbit. What I mean by that is the following. If I take cat and I rotate together with the cat, then the force that is keeping this cat in orbit is centripetal force from my point of view. It's centripetal force. But what cat is exerting is a centrifugal force because cat has a feeling, thinks that there is a force acting on it radially out. Namely, it would fly out if I let it go. In reality, it wouldn't fly out. It would continue coasting in the straight line in the direction of velocity wherever I let the cat go. If we assume there is no gravity resistance of air and so on. So you can see that the difference between <laughs> cat is playing around. So you can see that the difference between centrifugal and centripetal force is really in the point of view that we take to look at these two forces. It's the same phenomena looked from two different perspectives. So uh, I hope that today you learn uh, some particularities about centrifugal force on the surface of the Earth and uh, you know how to differentiate between centrifugal and centripetal force. Until next video, goodbye.